a great joy to be here to share my story. Thank you for giving me a chance to be the one to speak because I do know we all have stories to share. We all have pain we go through in our lives and it teaches us something. But you want me to share tonight. <laughs> the genocide, as you saw in the documentary, started in 1994. I was a student in college and I have just happened to be home for Easter holiday. And I never forgot the date it all started. It was Wednesday, 7th of April. I was sleeping in the morning, 6 o'clock. My brother, who had just finished his master's degree, he was also home for the holiday. He came to my room and pushed the door, and he gave me the news that the president of the country died. I remember jumping out, and I said, oh my gosh, they're going to kill us. I remember he said, why? Why do you think they will kill us? I said, you see, whatever used to say that we are bad, where well, Rwanda had two main tribes, three tribes. One was like, really like 1%, the others were you know, the remaining of the country. Somehow, my tribe was hated. But it is a long story that starts from the time of colonialization. The Belgians colonized our country, 1994, 1900, and some, one time, really where the trouble started, the king wanted them to leave, but the colony was there to colonize. But the country thought they are here as visitors. Now they're starting to take over little by little. So what they did was they divided the people of the country in two main tribes, Hutu and Tutsis. Every tall person, those were the criteria. Every tall person became a Tutsi. Every short person became a Hutu. And that was also the height, depending on whatever measurements they had. They had a measurement of what the nose is supposed to, to look like, and the size between the eyes is supposed to be. And if you fell into this category, you became one tribe. If you fell in the other, you became the other tribe. To a point where you're among brothers, same father, same mother, became different tribes. And from that moment on, that how evil can be so bad, and attack anybody from the nails, they can make you different. And if evil slides into that, you can kill each other out of the sizes of the nails. We really have to kill God our hearts and be smart. So they divided and then they issued identity cards, which was like a driver license we use here in the US. And they wrote on that driver license, the identity card, who you were. And from that second, you could not go back. You were Tutsi or you were Hutu. So when they want, the king was against them, like, please stop doing this, they said, oh, you are a Tutsi. Then let's go to tell Hutus how bad Tutsis are. Then it became like two movement fighting, but for somebody's reason, the interest. Every war, there is no such a war that happened to any country, I believe, because people are different. They just hate each other. They wake up, they want to kill each other because they were created different, differently. It is always the propaganda of the leaders for their own interest that will make up something and then they will you know, grow that and become hatred, but really manipulating. So that's how the whole tribes were created. In the beginning, Rwandans were like, oh good, Tutsi, fine, until they started to tell you they are bad. And then the people really started to kind, oh, maybe they are. But by the time I was home, Around the time the genocide started, everything was good among neighbors. The radio you saw in the documentary, that is the radio that really propagated the hatred among people for two years before the genocide, because they were preparing it. They used to say on that radio, the journalists, they used to make it themselves like they were drunk. They would say, like, give me scotch, give me whiskey. One day we'll kill them. They are not human beings. Have you seen? They have horns. They have tails. And as a tooth, you just look down like, oh my God, I never had to wear any high heel because I don't want to be taller. Because being tall was bad. And you see in the magazine, all the tall girls are beautiful. I'm like, I want to go there. <laughs> so we, we grew up just like trying to shrink like that. When my brother told me, my mind went right back. Oh my gosh, this is it. That what they were preparing. They were going to kill us. It was just like a movie in my head. I went out, I met my parents, we were all worried. And I remember we put on the radio. After two hours, the whole thing had started, BBC radio. 
have reported 18 families that were killed by the guards of the president, saying that they were bad. 18 families outside. They were killing things like reporting, they were reporting like 10 children and mom and dad have just been killed. Eight children and mom and dad have just been killed. And then I remember my father saying, this never happened before. We have they killed the whole family. Well, that's why they call it a genocide. The attempt to eliminate a whole group of people. About the end of the day, we had so many people around my home. So many people, thousands of people. By the second day, we had about 10,000 people. And people were asking my parents what to do. As I was saying about the lessons I have learned throughout this genocide, that was a moment when I saw people coming. From the moment they say that the president died, a day before my father was speaking to all people, they have blocked the borders of the country. They shut down every activity in the country. The only thing was being done was killing people family by family. And then he said, if this is the government, even then we do not have to fear or worry. We should take this as a chance God is giving us to repent our sins so we can go to heaven. In my life, I never thought of heaven as real as my dad put it. I mean, you hear people telling people how to run, doctors how to give you medication so you can heal. You don't tell people how to die. And he's not a doctor who is telling them you, you might die so you can see this as a chance. He is dying with them. He's a tootsie just like them. I'm like, Really? Well, in that second, I was repenting in my heart. Everyone went quiet. We were all thinking about, have I done anything? Anybody I have think of bad? Let me just be clear things with God in case we die. And after a few minutes, we are all kind of repenting in our hearts. We started shouting again. He came to me from there, handed me a rosary. Exactly like this, somebody made it as a replica, red and white. The other one, somebody stole it. I wrote a, a, the story in my second book, Led by Faith. And he handed me a rosary. He said, I want you to go to hide. I cannot protect people and worry about you. As one girl, everyone wanted to protect me. And I really left out of obedience. I thought, what if I go and something happen? He's like, you need to go. I'm asking you to leave. My brother was there. And I remember he told my dad, Dad, you're asking her to go to somebody from the other tribe who is not our friends. And if things go bad, they might kill her. As I was saying, I remember my father saying, I know that man. Even if things go bad, he will not be able to kill. And that really what reminded me of what he used to tell us. Don't judge people. Don't put people in boxes. It's much easier when somebody from that religion does wrong to point finger to everybody. From that race to point a finger to everybody. From that state to... They're all the same. So make an effort to welcome people. Give them a chance to prove you wrong. And then protect yourself. And that day, it was the time I just said, he really meant it. We're about to die. And he's sending me to somebody who seemingly is supposed to be our enemy. But he knew him because he allowed his heart to know the man. I went to him. And I, this man put me to sit in the bathroom. Small bathroom, three by four feet. About three in the morning, he came to look for me where he put me for. I remember when I saw the place. This is a student coming from co college. I have my own room at the university. And I have my own home, ro home. All the boys slept in one room. One daughter, I had my own. And they put me to sit in a bathroom, three by four feet. I remember looking, this is too small for me. What am I going to do? When he went back and brought five more women. Later, I went back and brought two more women. We were eight people in a place of three by four feet. We were literally sitting on the top of each other. The youngest was seven years old. She had to sit on our lap. Over time, we lost weight, so we can really fit a little bit better. <laughs> but when he put us there, he told us not to make any noise not even to flush the water of the bathroom until somebody else is flushing the water in the next bathroom. That was kind enough. I, love has a way of warming the heart. It felt good that he was trying to help, you know, to protect that much. He told us that he would tell his children that he lost the key of the bathroom so no one would come there, even if over time they were asking him to bring a technician. And that was like dying. 
to hear that outside, to break the door. So thank God that was only house in the whole village. You don't even know how blessed you are. But if you think about that, you will be thanking God every day. You will be so happy with what you have. It was only house in the whole village that had two bathrooms in one house. And that house was given to him as a gift by a school he helped build. And that's why they built two bathrooms inside. Otherwise, in Rwanda, especially my poor village, we just have a bathroom inside, one or one outside, and nothing. We sat there. I remember the first week, I had so many emotions. I just couldn't be there and accept that I was in the bathroom. First, we thought it was going to be two, three days. And the fourth day went by, and we were still sitting on the top of each other. I was tired. I was impatient. You know when you feel, there are some emotions, by the way, you don't know until you feel them. When somebody tells you they feel this way, just ask them how you can help. Because sometimes you just don't know what they are going through. I remember wanting to die out of being a patient. How? And when? And why me? Why, uh, why am I supposed to be in the bathroom? This is not even like I'm a stranger in another home, in another village. I am in my own village where people loved me. And I'm hiding for something I have not done. I have not created. God made me so. Why is it so bad? The man came to give us food. The food he could afford was. The leftovers of his children. The food we ate and mashed and put in the garbage. And we were going to grab one plate at night. Because no one knows we are there. And we'd come and throw it in the bathroom and run. Not that he wanted to give us that. But that what he could afford to give us. It was so hard. And when he brought us food, I grabbed him. And I had an idea. Something was like, ask him at least what's going on. We couldn't talk. I asked him, put a radio outside so we can hear what's going on in the country. Then you can think of what you can do if you know. He was kind. He put three radios, different channels, in different corners of the bathroom outside. I couldn't believe what I was hearing in my ears on radio. The government that used to hide behind the private radio was now calling everybody to go out and kill people of my tribe. I remember one man who had a PhD, a father of one of my girlfriend, actually, from high school, who were in a boarding school. We went to school with many rich children. He went on radio and said how, laughing, they have killed thousands of people who have run to stadiums they used to go on the edges of the stadium and they would throw hundreds of grenades inside and blow up everybody. They would go to churches or like in a place like this, make holes at the edge, pour gas and fire and blow up everybody inside. And he was laughing. How they have done great. And then he said, when you see children, don't forget them. A child of a snake is a snake. And a child of a cockroach is a cockroach. They were calling us cockroaches and snakes. And that's what people do. That's all we do. When we call people stupid, we don't want them to have the same dignity as us. When we call them a less name, we insult them. We want to min minimize their humanity so then we can hate them better. Because if they're a human being like us, then we have to respect them. So they called us all small names so that the mind can think, oh, this is not a human being. So he said, don't forget the children. I remember thinking, what happened to people? I remember feeling like I had two voices on my shoulders. And one voice was telling me, very reasonable, very smart, open the door. End the torture. This is too much. You can't take it. How long? They will find you anyway. I know. This is a four-bedroom house. How do you think 300 people are not going to find one bedroom, one door. It's just impossible. Then, on the other hand, there was another voice that was saying, don't open the door. Remember? Ask God to help you. You remember who God is? Because everything was confused now. God is almighty. Remember what that means, almighty? It means he can do anything. Anything. Do you know what that anything is? This is one of those anything things. I'm like, that's right. If God can be almighty, this is nothing to him. 
I remember asking God in my heart, if you are there, if you exist, if somebody made me, if somebody put all this together, I am begging you, don't let the killers find the door of the bathroom. If they don't find it today, I will know it is you who did it. Because in my human intelligence, I don't see how 300 people, 400, can miss out one door in a four-bedroom house. I think after that I fainted. The good God knew I couldn't handle those two conversations. <laughs> I think I didn't hear nothing until five hours later. The man who was hiding us, he came in. We literally thought the killers have found us. We were still frozen. And then he told us that they left three hours before. He's like, you didn't know? Well, you should have told us early. <laughs> but he told us what happened. He, he told us there were 400 people about that. He told us that a number of them, when they came in, like a hundred of them went to make a circle around the house to make sure that nobody jumps out of the window. Another number went on the top of the house on the ceiling to make sure that nobody goes there. Another number went in the ceiling of the house, on the roof and the ceiling, with flashlights to make sure that nobody is laying there hiding. And then they went in every room, under the beds, in the closet. They even opened suitcases to see if there was babies. At last, they came right to the door of the bathroom. He said one of the killers touched the handle, and before he opened, the man said he was sweating, he was shaking. They could have just looked at his face. They would have known that was the place. He said he touched the handle, and before he opened, he told him, you know what? We trust you. You are a good man. You are a good guy. You can't hide this bad people. And he said they turned around and left. The man told us, I don't know what you are praying, how you are praying, <laughs> but whatever you are doing, keep doing it. <laughs> In that second, the shocking part for me was, oh my God, God is real. God heard me in the bathroom. I didn't even talk. He read my thoughts. God is real. I can keep talking to him. Then something was like, well, you better get to know him before you lose your faith again. And I thought, how am I going to do it? Well, how can you do it? You can't talk. You can't go to church. You can't talk to nobody. Ask a pastor or a priest. And I remember something said, ask him to give me a Bible. At least we can read since you can't talk. I grabbed the man. I asked him if he can give me a Bible. I had the rosary my dad gave me. It was everything I had and the clothes I had on my back. We were not showering, not brushing the teeth. I don't remember any smell in that bathroom. I only remember the fear outside, inside my heart, from people, nothing else. And we're going to the bathroom right in front of each other. We're eight ladies, and we are, many of us, we're adults. So it was just not easy. So I took the Bible, and I started to read. Not how sometimes we read the Bible, just to make sure we prayed for the day. I was reading, questioning, and asking him, what does it mean? What this land means from what was before that and what happened after that. I wanted to know the whole story. And believe me, that helped me to put things in perspective and wanted to seek more how do you get there. And reminding me, if anyone is dying, our people are not lost. There is life after that. And if you can make it, lucky are you. Blessed are you. We ended up staying in that bathroom three months from April to July, in that same bathroom, never spoke to each other. We don't know when it is ending. Even if we followed on radio, we can feel things changing. We came out when the government that was on power have run away from the country, and people from my tribe and the other tribe took over the country who were against the genocide, and they were free. But when we came outside, I remember the very first day, I found out that everybody in my family was killed. I was really hoping that maybe somebody's hiding. My, da my dad, my mom, my two brothers, my grandma, my grandpa, 
my uncles, my aunts, my neighbors, my schoolmates, my best friends, everybody was killed. A million people was killed in a period of three months. Rwanda is the size of Maryland state. Everywhere was dead bodies and dogs were eating people. It was those things you only saw in the stories or you heard, you read in Revelation, not something can happen in your lifetime. I remember over and over, like, why my generation? Why in the whole world, me? If I am talking to you, it does not mean that my message only concerns Rwanda. Not even just Africa, but the whole world. And when I wrote that book, I really had my new home in mind, in my heart. Because I live here now in America. And I had the whole world in mind. If we can make mistakes and don't love each other, don't care enough about God, at least you can. At least we can. Here, I have children now. Again, I have to protect my family. But there's no better protection than truly coming back to the core values, to care for one another, 